Hi there, welcome to Apes Chapter 18, lecture video number two. We are in the climate change chapter, so let's begin. The first concept of this section is called radiative forcing. Well, what is that? Well, that's how much energy, okay, that a certain factor, like these are factors here, um, exerts on the Earth's temperature. So some of them have cooling trends, some of them have warming trends. So CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, halo carbon, these are all greenhouse gases. Ozone is a greenhouse gas, sometimes, not always, because if it's high in the stratosphere, it has a cooling effect as shown here. If it's in the troposphere, it has a warming effect. So warming effect, warming effect. Albedo is the ability of a surface to reflect light, not absorb, reflect light. So the more albedo something has, the cooler it's going to be. Okay. If it's soot, though, if it's a dark object, it's going to get warmer. So there's different things have different albedos. Soot has a low albedo. It's going to absorb more than it's going to reflect. Aerosols from our last lecture, we told you that we had a cooling effect that reflected light away from the earth. Okay. Overall, there is a 2.3 watts per meter squared radiative forcing, meaning because it's a positive value, the earth is gradually getting warmer over time. We learned in our first lecture that about 340 watts per meter squared come in per squared meter come in per day. Um, and about ideally you need 340 leaving to not have a positive radiative forcing. But based on this data, we are showing a positive 2.3. So we are actually uh, getting warmer and warmer as time passes. Now, Trends in climate sometimes um, are out of our hands. They're natural occurrences. So Milankovitch cycles are different trends and changes that happen. And these changes lead to changes in climate potentially. So this doesn't have to do with greenhouse gases. This is the earth doing things that it normally does not do. And they don't happen that often. But when they do happen, they could lead to things like a a warming trend or an ice age or different things of that sort. So let's begin. Let's talk about the things that can affect climate. Um, first one is an axial wobble. What, what does that mean? That means that the earth doesn't rotate beautifully. There's a wobbling effect when it is actually rotating or spinning, so to speak. This wobble means different parts of the world will have different solar radiation. Okay, distribution for that window of time, and it'll, it could shift climate for a window of time, right? Also, sometimes the Earth isn't, it's supposed to be tilted 23.5 degrees, but there is sometimes a variation in that tilt, plus or minus, in some cases, up to 25 degrees, so almost plus or minus three degrees, it could change. If the Earth is tilted differently, you're going to have different angles at which the sun is striking parts of the Earth, and you can have a shift in, in climate for a window of time. The third kind is a variation of an orbit, all right? So this was a tip. The red is the original orbit. The sun orbits the, excuse me, the earth orbits the sun one time every year. That's a year, how long it takes us to get around the sun. And every now and then it might get elongated and become even more elliptical. When this occurs, you might have distances where you're much farther than the sun than anticipated, where areas got colder than normal. You can have an ice age. You can have different things that take place. So there's other effects on climate other than just greenhouse gases. That's just one major one. And greenhouse gases are anthropogenic, human-centered, whereas these are natural. These are just things that happen naturally over time. Um, another thing that can change climate on our planet, this is a natural climate changer, um, how much radiation we're actually receiving from the sun. The sun has hot spots and it has cooler spots and sunspots and different things on the sun where radiation is not always being released at the same amount. So that could be a potential difference in shifting climate at times. Also, the ocean. Um, the ocean absorbs a lot of the carbon dioxide that is produced in the air. So the oceans absorb carbon for us. They're not absorbing as much as they used to. So now more carbon dioxide is, is slowly building up in the air. So the oceans help help control things by absorbing a lot of the excess CO2 that we are producing. Now, as things get warmer, there's a problem though. As things get warmer, well, CO2 is a gas and gases are less soluble in warmer temperatures. So the ocean will be able to hold less CO2 as time goes on. 
The thermohaline circulation, this is a picture of it here, and this is the movement of thermo of heat and salt water around the earth. So the ocean transports heat as it moves around the earth. All right. You probably remember from a previous unit on their oceans chapter where we have the water coming off the, the Gulf Coast water, the Gulf Stream coming up towards Europe and different things of that sort. So this is water coming up towards Europe, the Gulf Stream coming up, bringing the heat with it. OK, um, there's a problem, though. There's a lot of melting ice sheets up here and melting ice sheets are adding a lot of fresh water to that thermohaline and it's cold fresh water to that thermohaline circulation. So there's a belief that the melting ice sheets due to climate change are going to have a major impact. Okay. Potential impact on climate. Also, we learned in a previous chapter when we talked about El Nino and what happens in the equatorial Pacific when air pressure changes, um, that could be a relationship with climate change also. So there's a lot of factors other than just greenhouse gases that are linked to climate change. Paleoclimate, well, what's paleoclimate? Paleoclimate is caveman climate. And what does that mean? Well, climate of the past. Ideally, if we can know what things were like in the past, then we can measure them and compare them to what we have in the present, and we can see how much things have changed. Well, we have things that indicate climate of the past. They're called proxy indicators. This gentleman here is, is digging into an ice core sample, and they're pulling up samples of ice from deep below um, that are frozen up to 800,000 years ago in some cases. And they've pulled up these ice samples, and within these ice samples are trapped air bubbles. They can pull up these air bubbles, and they can analyze the air that's trapped in them, and they can give you an idea of what the air was like in that period of time, up to about 800,000 years ago, depending on how deep or where this ice sample was taken from. will de will determine how old it was. The air that's found in there tells us a lot. Okay, it tells us what the atmosphere at that time was made of. So right now we know we're at 78% nitrogen gas, 21% O2 gas, and then less than 1% all the remaining gases. If we look at, we can look at atmospheric composition of past. Was there as much oxygen? How much CO2 was present? And so on and so forth. Okay, so that leads to what was it? What percentage was it? How much greenhouse gases were there in the past? It can tell us temperature trends in the past, what the temperature was like how much snowfall or solar activity they had, frequency of fires and volcanic eruptions. How can we tell that? Because there might be soot, there might be ash and soot in these air samples because that is particulate matter is something that is an airborne particle. So those are the kinds of things that you can find in this trap bubbles. It tells us a lot about how life was in the past, all right? Other samples, other proxy indicators, there's a lot of them, and you need to be aware of them because environmental science utilizes proxy indicators to give you an idea of how things have changed. We need to back up our data with something, and we're backing it up with proxy indicators. Um, sometimes they look at sediments, like this picture here, and core samples. Why sediment cores? Well, you get pollen grains. Well, why would pollen grains tell us about what was going on in the past? Well, if we know what kind of plants existed in that time, plants will tell us climate. See, so the climate selects the plants that can live there. The plants then are able to survive, survive and thrive in that planet, in that climate. So pollen grains will tell us what plants were around. Therefore, we have an idea of what the weather slash climate was in that window of time. Tree rings, they're usually tell you how much rain you had in a season. The width of the ring tells you whether you had a very good growth season, which would have meant more rain or less rain for that, for the, for the most part. Pack rat middens, what are these? Well, these are rodents, like little rats. And middens are their dens. Well, what do they do? Well, they build these dens in these dry regions. They live in these dry areas, these caves, these nooks, these crannies in the ground where are dry, arid areas. And they pick up plants and plant parts and plant seeds and different things. They take them back to their den. And they technically, they actually get stored very well because they generally live in dry areas. So they, they don't get messed with moisture and these parts don't decompose. They're, they're, they're present there for a long time. So when we find pack rat middens, we can find out information from the past. Coral reefs also. We can take isotope concentrations. These are the, the 
actual what are the bands in the coral reef what are their chemical makeup and their isotopes and then we have a good idea of what past oceanic conditions were like um what are we doing to 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 talk about carbon dioxide co concentrations well in Hawaii and Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, they've been measuring since 1958 the carbon dioxide concentrations. I believe you've seen a graph like this on a past test. I've talked about increasing carbon dioxide and what is it doing to pH of the ocean. It's dri driving the pH of the ocean down. Um, what they've calculated here is that we're now exceeding the 400 part per million number. This is bad news. Like I, if you, in the lecture, I, I, I mentioned to you that, you know, we never, when I began teaching this class, our goal was to never get to 400 as an average, and now we're above it. Trends and future impacts. So these are a lot of a lot of information on this picture that you have in your book. So let's talk about all the trends and impacts of this climate change. Well, glaciers, ice caps, ice sheets, they're melting. Sea levels are rising as a result of that. Sea levels are rising as a result of two things. It's not just the melting ice caps and glaciers and ice sheets. There's this thing called thermal expansion. Gases, as they get warmer, they take more space. And the gases in the ocean that are naturally dissolved, as they get warmer, they take more space. So the ocean is expanding as a result of the higher temperature. So oceans are rising not only because more fresh, excuse me, more water, these freshwater sources are melting and ending up in the ocean. That's one reason, but it's the thermal expansion of the ocean that is also that is making the oceans rise. That goes down to this bullet here that says sea levels are rising. Well, what does sea levels rising do? You have saltwater intrusion into aquifers that are coastal. So Miami, for example, oh man, many times a year, they'll have saltwater coming up from the ground into their coastal communities. There's nothing you can do about it. It'll kill your grass because grass does not do well with saltwater. So coastal communities there are getting an uh, uh, influx of a lot of saltwater coming up from their aquifers that was that was basically contaminating and making their aquifers salty. Aquifers, just so you know, water, fresh water and aquifer pushes back on the salt water naturally as it flows off of the land and it kind of creates a, a, a balance so you don't have this intrusion of salt water. Well, because the oceans are rising in this thermal expansion, the oceans are pushing back farther into these aquifers and you're having more salt water where you don't want it on land where people are now losing the, that fresh water source. Um, we mentioned in an earlier chapter, this warming, this increased CO2 is making the ocean more acidic. Um, ocean waters are getting warmer, which means there's also less oxygen dissolved. All right. It's affecting the thermohaline circulation around the world. Um, we're getting heavier rain in areas on the planet that we normally get a lot of rain, they're getting more heavier storms. So zero degrees the equator and 60 degrees north and south are getting more rainfall than they typically would get. Drier places are getting less rain than they would normally get. For example, 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south is actually getting less rainfall. Deserts are becoming more desert-like, so they're getting warmer. Um, it's shifting the planet in that regards. Heat waves and droughts are becoming more frequent. Bigger storms that are tropical are becoming more common. Um, in the Arctic areas, and I'll explain to you in a little while, Arctic areas are experiencing a much more rapid change to climate change. So question on AP test is where on the planet will you expect a, a bigger effect due to climate change and expect it in the polar regions? And I'll explain to you in a little bit why. All right. Temperatures are continuing to rise, and these pictures are showing you uh, global temperatures measured since 1880, and they're showing what's happened since 1880. We had some cooling trends. In 1880, why? You're talking going back to the Industrial Revolution. So you're talking some cooling windows, and then it just started getting warmer, went down a little bit, warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer. So we have gradually gotten warmer. This is just the northern hemisphere showing you what's happened in the northern hemisphere over time and what's happening now. This is just the U.S. right here, okay? Most areas of the U.S. have risen by at least one full degree Fahrenheit in the past 20 years. This just goes back to, to uh, oh, we're, well, those 20 years would be from the frame of reference of when this book was probably written in this section. So we'll talk about 30 years back to 1991. So about 30 years back, 
we've gone up probably a little bit more than one degree because this isn't accounting for after 2012 and what's happened until now, 2021, and when I'm recording this video in 2021, all right? Um, here's polar regions. Well, what's happening in polar regions? And I'll tell you right now, and it's gonna, it's actually coming up in our next lecture, but I'll tell you right now. Polar regions, because they are loaded with ice already, they have, those regions naturally have what's called a high albedo. Albedo is an ability to reflect light. So ice reflects light very well. But what's happening to these areas, because the climate is changing, it's getting warmer, the ice is melting. So there's less ice there that used to be there. What is being left when that ice melts? You're left with, with water, if it's in the ocean, or you're left with ground, rocks. Well, the water and the ocean absorbs more um, light energy than it does reflect. So therefore, what's happening on the poles is that ice that is melting is now, because the ice is melted, there's less albedo. So the area is actually getting warmer at a much more rapid rate compared to other parts of the world. The ice helps regulate the, the climate in these polar regions. So it keeps them cooler and then they just stay cold. But now that the ice is melting, they're warming up very quickly because rather than reflecting light, albedo, they have less of it. They're now absorbing more of it. And that absorption is converting that energy into infrared, which is heat. And now you're having even more melting effect. It is a positive feedback loop. As more ice melts due to climate change, there's less albedo then more ice will melt because there's going to be more heat absorbed. And then more ice melts, less albedo more ice will melt. It keeps going. It is a positive feedback loop. We'll stop there.